Hello, new pick. This is uh, Matt Taylor again, the open source community flag bearer for the Minta platform for intelligent computing. And I'm coming back to you with another tutorial that I'm calling the One Hot Gem Prediction Tutorial. It's the first in what hopefully will turn into a series of tutorials. This is gonna be the first and simplest one. Um, and I am going to uh, show you how this tutorial works. The source code is available online on our repository here at github.com slash numenta slash newpick and it is in the examples OPF clients hot gem prediction folder under one gem. So there's a readme there and we are going to basically build up this tutorial and uh, sort of mostly from scratch so you can see how it works. Uh, so I am in my shell here. I've got a couple of files I'm going to start with, but aside from those, we're, we're pretty much going to go from, from scratch. Um, let's look at the data first. So I've got a file here called Rec Center Hourly. It's a comma delimited file. And if you take a look at this data, it is basically just two fields or two columns. One is called timestamp, one is KW energy consumption for kilowatt energy consumed in that time or at that time. So these are already pre-aggregated hourly, um, most likely averaged over the hour. Um, if we take a look at this data, let me just grab, I don't know, a few hundred rows and plot it. We are going to see some patterns emerge here and uh, which is great because that's what NewPick does well at identifying temporal patterns. Uh, so as you can see we've got a pretty uh, regular pattern. Um, so what this actually is is date on the x-axis and kilowatts of energy consumed in a gym, a building, um, on the y-axis and you can see daily patterns here. So every spike is a day. Uh, I'm going to back off on this a little. Let's take a few hundred less rows and see if we can get something that looks a little bit nicer. There we go. <clears throat> All right, now you can see it a little better. So we've got a day here and then a bump in between the days. So we've got a major pattern and a minor pattern here. That bump in between the days is actually when the cleaning crews came in uh, the off hours of gym time and did their vacuuming and stuff like that. So they had um, energy consumed during that period. Um, and there's also, you can sort of tell, there's, there's some re somewhat regular patterns during the day. There's an, usually an initial spike. Um, and if you, uh, uh, a spike in the, in the first part of the morning, Sometimes there's sort of spikes at the end of the day. These probably coincide with people's work schedules as they're coming and working out. Um, if uh, I'm not going to continue to dive in, but there's also weekly patterns. On the weekends, uh, there's not necessarily as busy, it seems. The energy consumption is slightly different on the weekends versus the weekdays. So this is the data that we're going to be evaluating with... Um, in, within NUPIC. And it's within this rec center hourly file, as you can see here. Uh, we've got a timestamp and then an energy consumption value. So <clears throat> what we first need to do, because what we what we need is to create a NUPIC model uh, that represents the, the parameters for the CLA um, before we can start passing this specific data into that model. And the best way to get a model like this is to run a swarm over the model. So um, that's what we're going to do. There is a wiki documentation about what a swarm is on our wiki. Um, I'm not going to go extensively into it, but I will talk about it as we go along. So I'm going to do this in Python. I'm going to try and do this in, in the simplest way. I can. So I'm going to start with just an empty file here. We're going to call it swarm. Um, I'm going to make it a, an, an executable Python file. 
and we will just do some of the uh, obligatory stuff. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna do some cutting and pasting here just to make it a little bit easier. So if it's main, we'll call a function on ourselves called swarm, and we want to tell it our input file, which is rec center hourly csv. So assuming we're going to have a function called that swarm input file. All right, we're not doing anything quite yet. Just get some formatting issues out of the way. <clears throat> okay. So the first thing we want to do is we know there's there are these um, libraries, modules with a NuPic that we're going to have to use. One of them is called the permutations runner. Uh, so here, here it is. From NuPic swarming, we're going to import something called the permutations runner. This is what has the function that will actually run the swarm. And it's called a permutations runner because what a swarm is uh, is a description of what to sort of what the data looks like and where the data is, and then a description of all the permutations you want to uh, run. And the swarm is a collection of permutations uh, of those configurations and it continuously creates models, passes data into them, and it kind of generates what the error score is, and then goes on to another one, and then and it's, uh, it's short for particle swarm optimization um, algorithm. And so it drops off, it drops models that don't do as well, and it just continues to build new models and with different configurations based on the permutations you specify. So it will come back, uh, depending on how large you make your swarm, with uh, um, either a, a good set of model parameters, basically based on how many models it created and evaluated, it'll give you the best one that it found. Uh, so that's what we're, that's what we use swarming for, and that'll be it should give you a decent representation of your data to new pick. The tricky thing is to even run a swarm to do anything, we have to have a swarm description. And I already have a swarm description here. Let's take a look at it. Swarm description. Uh, this is just a configuration. This isn't really code. It's just a, this is a Python dict. It could also be defined in a JSON file. Uh, but it includes some things that you have to tell it about the data. So, for example, included fields. These, this is defining the data. We know we're going to have a timestamp that is a date time data type. We're also going to have another uh, column of data in here called KW energy consumption. I just showed you that in the CSV file. Its data type is float, and I've already identified the min and max value just by looking through that file. And this helps the swarm runner identify um, exactly what permutations it's going to run. Okay, so the stream def uh, defines where the input data is coming from. Um, in this case, it is the we're calling it rec center, and the source is actually the file location. You have to have this file colon slash slash prefix on it. I believe that's the only supported protocol at the moment, so you must have this. And it's just pointing to the file in our current directory. So this could be absolute or relative file location. Um, so really, all this is is all we really are worried about here is the name and the and the source file location and we're just telling it to swarm over all columns if we had lots of columns in here we could restrict the number of columns we wanted to uh, swarm over or include in our swarm permutations um, by name inference type is temporal multi-step uh, because this is temporal data and it's a multi-step prediction there's other options there like uh, multi uh, anomaly temporal anomaly um, just regular multi step with no temporal aspect and then non temporal multi step but we know this is a temporal multi step problem our inference args uh, this is where you can define how many steps ahead you want to make predictions so we're doing a one step ahead prediction if I wanted more I could add a 
five step ahead prediction, a 10 step ahead prediction, etc. Now I would have three predictions for every input row, but we're just going to do one right now. And we have to tell it what is the predicted field. Well, I want to predict kilowatt energy consumption. Okay, the last two things, iteration count uh, tells it whenever it creates a model, how many rows of data should it send to it before it uh, ends its valuation. Negative one means all the data, or you could just put 100 or 1,000 or whatever you like in there. And, and then we have swarm size, which is just small, medium, or large. Small is just for debugging. Medium is usually what you want, and large will increase the number of models that are evaluated and take a very long time. So you only want to go from medium to large when you have a lot of time, and you want to get as much, uh, and you want to get as good of a model out of it as possible. So this is my uh, swarm description file. So back to our our script that we're writing that's going to actually run the swarm. Um, <clears throat> let me just import that. So I can say, uh, I think it was just called swarm description. So from swarm description, that's the file that we just showed, import, and I had it saved as a constant, swarm description. So that data structure is now imported within this constant called Swarm description. All right. So now we're going to actually try and do the swarm. OK. <clears throat> so in the end, what we need to do is call the permutations runner and call run with config. Now, if you watched my last tutorial, which was about uh, predicting sine waves, I did this a little bit differently. Since then, I've updated the code to make this a little easier. So it's now run with config, you, so you don't have to uh, write a JSON file. Um, so I'm going to just kind of throw the parameters in here that are required for this. Uh, let me clean this up a little. And then we'll fill them in. OK, so uh, I don't like the way we're uh, so what we want is the swarm config as the first thing, which we know is actually swarm description. So this is the first thing we're running with the config. We pass the config into it. And then we have some options, which, um, which we're going to tell it how many workers are going to be used for this. I'm going to give it four. Uh, this means basically how many cores are going to be used and whether to overwrite uh, any existing files that are created during the swarm. The swarm creates some temporary working files and you have to tell it overwrite if you're going to do multiple swarms like in a row just testing things out. So I always usually tell it overwrite. I don't really care if it overwrites the files. Okay, other than that we need to give it an output label. Um, let's just call it uh, rec center we need an output directory now I am going to make a directory in here called swarm so let me just stop what I'm doing there and do that first um, and I'm going to call it a, a permanent work der, perm work der, or permanent work directory uh, let's just call it swarm work dir let's do that and we'll say absolute path swarm. So in now I need to import OS because I just used it. Um, so this is going to give me the path to a directory in my current working directory called swarm. And I don't know if it's going to be created or not. So we'll just say if not exists. Swarm work dir and make dir swarm work dir. And I'll, <clears throat> I'll do this the nice way. Okay, so we're creating a directory to run our swarm for all of our swarm cruft to go into. Um, and that's what that's for. So that's where we're going to call the out dir swarm work dir. 
Okay. Um, there's also the concept within the swarm of a permanent work directory, and we're going to set that the same because we're putting all of our output into the same place. And we'll just tell it verbosity equals zero, which I'm not sure even does anything, so let's just leave it out. I don't think it matters. Okay, so this is actually going to run the swarm. Um, let's see if that works. Nothing, why not try it out? Change mod 755 swarm pi swarm.py run. Syntax and valid syntax. Okay. Let's look on line six. Ah, uh, import, not input. And one more thing. I forgot a colon. It's going to be things like this. And otherwise, it is working. So this is what a swarm looks like. It dumps this stuff to the screen. And if you're paying attention to it, it's telling you details about the models that it's evaluating during the swarm process. Um, I'm going to, I think, kill this right now because this can take a really long time, even a medium swarm. I've got it running on four cores because I put max workers equals four. If you want it running on more than that, you can increase that or decrease it however you like. I'm going to kill it. Unfortunately, these processes are going to live on, so I'm going to kill all Python processes. That will ensure that all of my um, swarm processes aren't running in the background. Uh, and what I'm going to do, because we're experimenting here, is I'm going to go into my swarm description. I'm going to give it an iteration count of one, which if you remember what I said recently, that will feed it one row of the input data per model, which will be very fast. And I'm going to tell it it's a swarm size of small, which means it's only going to evaluate one model. So by doing this, I can run swarm now, and we can watch it evaluate one model, send in one row of data into it, and, and return very quickly with the parameters for that one model that it tried, which is not going to be a very good model for our data. <clears throat> But at least we know that our swarm script did work. Um, and now if you look into our directory here, you can see there is a swarm directory. This is where we are we're working directory for swarms. And it's got this uh, model zero. This is where it, it dumps stuff for its swarms. And there's a model parameters file here. That's, that's what we want. We want this model parameters file. Um, so we could write some code to, you know, dump that or move that from where it's at into somewhere that we want it um, so that we can import it in our own script if we like. But um, we can also get it programmatically from the permutations runner because it returns this object when it runs run with config. Uh, but I know I'm going to want to put this in a directory here. So I'm going to make a directory called model params. And that model params object, let's take a quick look at it. We'll go into swarm model zero model params. So it's a Python file, but all it is is a configuration with one constant called model params. And this is this represents the best model it found during the swarm, mm -hmm. although it didn't work very hard on that because we used a small swarm and it only evaluated one. Um, so this model params, I want to eventually go into this so that I can just import it. And I'm going to touch a file in here. This is a Pythonism called init. So that means that I can use that model params as a Python module. And I'm going to uh, go into our swarm.py and let's make a little, let's do this. We know this function is going to return model that's the object that we want and what I want to do is we'll say write to uh, we'll tell it model params eh, let's make this a little bit more explicit write model params and we'll send it the model params object and now we're going to <clears throat> 
create this function, write model params, model params, okay. And so the how we're going to do this is we need to be a little bit careful. I'm going to create a, uh, this needs to be, a, it's going to be a Python file, but it needs a, the, right, the proper name. So unfortunately, rec center hourly or whatever is is the name that we know. Let's just call it, um, let's just say params. Uh, let's get the out directory first. So we know the out directory is going to be, uh, we're going to join our current directory. Get thing CWD and the model params directory, right? So this is going to be our output directory. Um, and we'll also do the if not uh, path is dir. If it's not a directory, we're going to create it, make dir, so we don't have to mess with that. Okay, um, so the whole path of this file is going to be the join of uh, hold on, path, join, I forgot to put join here, there we go, <clears throat> of the out dir and a, we're just going to call it, let's just call it model params.py for now since we're just using this one, okay, um, and now we need to open a file with open out path as a writable file as out file model per params string. This is what we're going to pull out of that. We need to convert the model params object into a string. Um, so how I'm going to do this is, so it's sort of easy, we could just say, uh, maybe we could probably just do this with JSON, but I want it to look decent. Um, so I'm going to use this thing in Python called pretty printer. And I think it's just import pprint as pp, I'll just call it pp, I think that's pretty standard. No, no, we'll just call it pprint. Uh, okay, import pprint. Okay, and model param string. We are going to create a little preprint object up here. Equals pprint pretty printer, and I'm going to tell it indent equals two. So this will give us something that's readable, which I would like to have something that's readable. And then we can call, say, pp, that's our pretty printer, p format, which will turn whatever object we're about to pass into it, model params, into a string. So this will return us a string called model params string. Okay. And then we can say out file dot write. And we're going to tell model params equals, and we'll say, okay, we want a new line here. Um, so we need to slash 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 n, and then this string we want is model params string. Okay, not so bad, right? And then we return the out path, which is the path to the model params file we just created. I doubt this is going to work right off the bat, but let's try it. See what we get here. So running the swarm, one model, one row of data, and it looked like it did actually work. Do we have a model params folder? And we have a model params file. So take a look at that. VI model params 
mob params, there it is. It actually actually worked. Excellent. So this is the model params object we just wrote to file. That's what we need to create uh, our new pick model. Awesome. Okay, so that is essentially the swarm process there, sort of uh, automated. Um, now that we've got that working, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into our swarm description. Um, let's see, and I'm going to change this back into a negative one, which means go over all the data and a medium swarm. And I'm going to kick off a swarm. And I think I've got four workers, and that's fine with me. So let's, I'm going to kick off a swarm, and then we're going to move on to a uh, another tab here. Uh, bear with me, I will get one ready for you. Okay, guys, I am back here. Uh, so I've got one tab over here that's running a medium swarm over all of that input data. So that's going to take a while. So while that is running, we're going to go and move along and create another script, which is going to actually run the swarm. So vi run.py. So this is going to be our runner. I'm going to also make this one executable. So and then we'll add the if <clears throat> name equals name. We're going to have a function called run hot gym grand and def run hot gym. So some of you who know Python might be wondering why I'm not using a snake case, and it's because the there's a nuke convention within the Python code base to use camel case for stuff. So I'm just trying to adhere to that. Um, so, uh, all right, so we're going to run this, and let's say we've got a model. We need, okay, so we're gonna, let's, we're gonna make some assumptions here. So let's set up a few constants. Um, model, params, yeah, how can we, well, let's, let's just think about what we need to do. Um, we need to create a model. Um, let's break the steps down here. Uh, we need to create model. Okay. Um, we need to run model. And during that run model, we'll deal with that thing. So let's. This is going to be a little bit different from the uh, tutorial code and repository, but I'm trying to do this organically. So create model. Um, <clears throat> we've got our model param, so let's import that. Import model params. And we've got uh, one, actually, from model params, import model params. So what we're basically saying is from the model params, folder, import the module called model params, which is the file that we just wrote there. Probably could have named that a little better, but uh, at least it's safe. So we've got model params, and we need to actually create a model. So creating a model is pretty easy, but we need a model factory. And the model factory is part of the nupic module from nupic.frameworks. OPF, which is Online Prediction Framework Model Factory. We're going to import a class called Model Factory. So the way we use this Model Factory is quite easy. Um, our model equals Model Factory, create, and we use our model params. Get it? So, Model params here is the model params we just imported, which is coming from that file that we wrote in our step where we ran the swarm. Okay. Um, we also need to enable inference on this model, which means tell it what our predicted field is. So there is a function enable inference, and we're going to tell it predicted field. 
is what was it? Kilowatt energy consumption consumption, right? All right, and you turn the model. Okay, so we can say we've got a model. Created the model, run the model. I need a function that runs the model. Def run model model. So how do we run the model? Okay, so we're just going to kind of wing it here. Our input file is the same that we're using with this one. Rec center hourly. That's CSV, right? Um, and so we are going to need to open this thing up. Um, actually, let's call this input file path. Our input file is open input file path. Uh, readable. Okay. So that's our input file handle. <clears throat> and we're going to create a CSV reader, but we, before we can do that, we need to import it. CSV module package, excuse me, from Python. CSV reader equals CSV reader input file. So now we've got a CSV reader wrapped around it. There are some header rows that we want to skip. Next. One too many. So there's three header rows in that in that data file that we that are not data, they're just headers. Um, and so now we're at the top of the real data. Okay, so now that we are at the top of the real data, we're gonna start looping through. What we're going to do is I think we can just say four row in CSV meter. And that is our row. Um, let's do let's do a little count here too. Um, row set counter equals zero, two zeros, one zero. Okay. And then we'll just say if counter, so like every hundred, uh, we'll print out something. Fred, so many lines. Okay. Counter. And we'll just do this. This equals one. All right, so we've got our row. <clears throat> so we're going to, um, you know what our model, we've got our model, we've got our row, so now we just have to pull the timestamp out. And we're going to need to, so this is the first column that's our timestamp. And our consumption is our last column, the only other column is that. Now the timestamp is, is coming out as a string, so I'm going to need to format it. Uh, so for that, I'm going to need to import date time. And there's a formatter I can use date time, date time, it's TRP time. Um, so I give it that and I give it a date format, which I like to put as constants, and the date format is going to be the same if we, uh, if we look at our, if we look at our data, it was in the, it looked like this, All right, so Python, that's going to be lowercase m month and lowercase d day lowercase y year space upper h for m okay so i think that's the date format that we want here um 
That should be all right. So now we have our, now within our row, we've got our timestamp and we've got our energy consumption. Now we want to feed it into the nucleic model. Okay. So we do that by following the model and telling it to run and giving it an object. Object being, let's see, uh, a dict timestamp, which is timestamp that we just created. And we call this kilowatt energy consumption. And then we called it consumption in the variable name. Right, so we're passing one row of data into this model and we run it. Timestamp and consumption. Um, this actually returns us a result. This is the result that we're going to do something interesting with. Okay. Um, let's see. Now we can get the prediction out of this result by saying result dot inferences and the key we're looking for is multi step best predictions okay so that's going to, remember in our definition our sworn description where we had um, prediction steps and we just put one and we said you could put five or ten or whatever in here this is the predictions based on what you put there so we said one so we want one out if I had put five I could put five here and get five out but I didn't I only put one so this is going to be our prediction so that's inside of our result objects inferences uh, dict okay so that is our prediction um, and let's see, well, let's, for now, let's just print prediction. I don't know, I, I'm anxious to see if this even works. So I, I just typed a lot of code and I guarantee you it's not going to work. Change, five, 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 run dot pi, run dot pi. Okay, no module, no model factory. Okay, probably I just need to put that should be that. Is that right? Can't tell. <clears throat> oh no, it's just not capitalized. There we go. Run. Okay, line 66, model config model. Let's look at that. Oh, that's a model factory. But my line, line 16 and create model. Hmm. It says there's nothing. Uh, my model, so it looks like my model config is a little off. Not the buy line. Oh, yeah. So when I created this model factory with the model params, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know what the problem is. So let's look at the model params real quick. Model params, model params. Oh look, this there is a static, there, there's a constant variable here that I'm not using. I'm trying to use it, pass in just the module itself, not the actual object within the module. So that makes total sense. Uh, so when we get here, this should say, I'm creating model params not off the module, off of the model params object or configuration object within that module. Try it again. Hey, and it is does seem to be working. So we're actually getting predictions. These are predictions coming out of NewPick and being dumped onto the screen here. Alright. So I don't want them to be dumped onto the screen. I'd rather see something interesting happen. Uh, so I've got this nifty little file here called NewPick output. Um, that I used as well in the sign tutorial. Um, I'm not going to go over all the junk in here, but basically you can pass it uh, values and predictions, and it will either write them to disk or plot them in that plotlib. 
Um, so that's what I'd like to try and do at this point, instead of just dumping them to the screen. So <clears throat> we're going to need to import that. Uh, let's import it from Nupic output. Uh, let's just import Nupic output. Import Nupic output. Okay. So in my run model, I'm going to create a model or an output equals Nupic output. Um, dot Nupic Steve file output first, and then we'll go with something different. Okay. So Nupic file output first. Um, and I need to tell it the names of the things because it, it was written to handle many models at once. But we're just going to be passing it one, so I'm just going to send it a list of one thing, and we'll just call it rec center. Okay. So that's going to be reflected in how it writes the output file out. It'll be called rec center something. Okay, so we've got our output object here. And uh, so we should be able to just use this instead of printing the prediction. Um, assumptions, predictions. So, so we've got our consumption, which is row one here. We've got our, our uh, which is in the uh, input row here. And we've got our prediction, which came out of NewPick. So in our output, we can tell it to write a row out after we've created it. This takes arrays of things, so you're going to see me wrap everything in arrays. Um, so I'm going to send it the time stamp, because there's only one model, it's just one element in an array. I'm going to send it the uh, consumption and the prediction. Okay, so now I have to be careful here. Uh, one thing I didn't do was close any of my outputs. <laughs> so let me do that right now. Um, I have an input file here that I never closed, so I should close that. After we've done the loop over everything, close. And the output also has a close function, which will close any output files. Let's see if that works. Okay, let's run this. All right, it seems to be working. It's reading so many lines. Let's check on our swarm real quick. The swarm has finished, so I can have this available. And now you can see there's a rec center out file that's being written out. So that's what the NUPIC output is doing, is just writing it out to that rec center out file. <clears throat> so there it goes. It says it's done. Wrote all of the data uh, to the rec center file. Um, but I also want to make this plottable. Um, so I don't know if I'm not, probably not going to do this in the tutorial, but I'll at least show you that instead of a file output, I also have a plot output available. So there is my, I just changed the NuPic file output to NuPic plot output. Everything else stays the same. The only other thing that we need to do is shift the inferences. Uh, so when th what this does is basically it aligns the predictions with the input data so you can compare them like graphically. Um, so this is helpful when you're charting. So there's something called an inference shifter in, in NuPic that does this automatically because it's so common for us to do it. Um, so I'm going to go up and import this in the top here. Uh, it's called Nupic Data Inference Shifter, and the, uh, the class is called Inference Shifter. And we'll use that as a tool right here. Um, and I th let's see, you have to tell it, you, you send it the result, and you get back a new result. So we tell it shift, uh, actually, I need to create the shifter somewhere. How do I create the shifter here? Let's do it outside of this loop. Let's do it right before the output. Shifter equals inference shifter. That's all. And then we just use <coughs> that instance. 
and tell it to shift results. Is that right? So just shift, just shift, shift, and the result. So that will adjust that result so that the predictions are aligned with the actual values for plotting. So now when I run this, we will actually get something dumped to our screen here. So we can see in in the in the real time as NewPic is is getting data and outputting predictions from this data file. You can kind of see in the background it's read 200 lines now. Um, <clears throat> we can see the, the performance of NewPic as it goes. Um, one thing you will note here is the the green line is the predicted line and it's constantly trailing um, because it has it's only just seen these patterns so when it generally when it's learning patterns it's going to mimic the input as it goes along and just predict the last value that it saw until it gets a certain amount of data and then it starts getting better and better at recognizing the patterns that are occurring over time so we're just going to sit here and watch this for a while Hmm. Something seems odd here. Um, makes me wonder, am I, it looks so, they both look so similar. Makes me wonder if I, if I set this up properly. I'm going to pause this and reevaluate. I mean, those look exactly the same. As far as I can tell, which doesn't seem right to me. Okay, guys, I figured out what I was doing wrong here. Um, so I was just looking at that that graph, and it looked exactly the same. The prediction and and the consumption actual values looked so close; it just seemed very odd. It was just one was trailing one time step behind. What I forgot to do was cast the uh, consumption into a float so it was getting not a, a float value for the for the kilowatt energy consumption it must have been getting a string and then categorizing it somehow so I'd, um, I don't understand exactly why that caused that problem but uh, I would assume it would have thrown an exception or something because it was getting a data type that it didn't expect but it might have attempted to automatically box that into a uh, a uh, float value which could have turned it into who knows what so now that it's that is fixed you're gonna see something much more uh, dynamic here so there we can you can see it's not just uh, mimicking the input values anymore it's actually kind of bumping up and down it's getting to know the the data a bit why don't I uh, why don't I before we get into this. Let me go into new pick output and make this chart a little bit bigger. Um, I happen to know exactly where that code is because I wrote it. Where did it go? I thought I did. <clears throat> there we go. Um, figure size. Let's make this a 20 and times 4. Yeah, it sort of worked. No plot height. There we go. Let me just get a little a little bit bigger of a graphical display here. So I'm gonna sit and let this run um, and I'll come back when we get further down into the data so we can see how Nubik does uh, picking up these patterns. So we're over 600 lines into it and as you can see these daily patterns are, are getting, it's getting a little bit little bit better, a little bit worse at times, but um, 
So one thing you can notice is that it will occasionally nail the initial energy consumption of the day um, spot on. Sometimes it will uh, trail behind a little bit, um, but like for example, this one that's just coming by, uh, pretty pretty much got that. Uh, it's got that one pretty well. It, it gets better. The more it sees this pattern, this daily pattern, the better it gets. And look how well it got this day. Very, very good accuracy there on the, on the uptake and the downtake of energy consumption. It doesn't seem like it's quite gotten the weekends yet. This looked like a weekend that just, just went by. So that's a longer term pattern. The daily patterns, it's seen a lot more of those patterns than it has the weekend patterns just because, um, you know, it takes seven days of data to get the week pattern down. Um, but the, the daily patterns, it seems to be better. Um, it's going to let it keep going. So we're only still, you know, a quarter or a third of the way through the data at this point. Check it out now. It's it's really, uh, it's, it's nailing not only the daily patterns pretty well, but even the, the patterns within the day. So... The, the the morning and afternoon uh, bumps in energy consumption. Uh, it's also getting better at the weekends here. You can see that, that looked like a weekend. So we're now 2,300 lines into the data. We're about halfway through. Um, and it's doing pretty well at this point. It's getting the cleaning crew coming in pretty consistently. Not bad. About three fourths of the way through now, um, and Nupik is doing a pretty good job on these predictions at this point. Um, it is very consistently predicting the daily patterns. Of course, it's you know you're not going to it's not going to get every single thing, but as you can see, even patterns like this, it seems to do well predicting. Let's get the cleaning crews nailed down pretty good, um, and then the the weekends it's also doing well on. So at this point, it seems to have gotten a good understanding of the patterns within this data input. So that is pretty cool. I'm just gonna let this run through. Um, I appreciate all you guys watching this video. I hope it was informative. Um, I'm probably going to try and, and continue this series. There's some other uh, aspects of Nupik that I'd also like to write tutorials about, specifically uh, <clears throat> specifically um, anomaly detection. So a adding some anomaly detection to this would be interesting uh, so you can see how confident Nupik is in the predictions that it's making. Um, and then there's also some advanced swarming topics that you could take on when you have a bit more complicated data than we have in these, this example here. So, uh, looks like we are just about done with this data set, and there it is. So we've reached the end of the data, the la here's the last four days of the data, uh, which looks, looks pretty good. Um, thanks again for watching, uh, take care, and I uh, hope you enjoyed this and it was informative for you.